Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Thanks for being here again with us today. I am Anina Hansen, working with Mananoc Family Services in a program called Trauma Response of Mananoc. And along with the Greater Mananoc Collaborative Chamber of Commerce, we sit down and talk with people around the Mananoc region doing mananoc things. So thanks for being here on Voices of Mananoc today. And we have with us Mary Gannon, resident of Winchester. Mm -hmm. That's all we need to know. Take it away, <laughs> Mary. Tell me a little bit about yourself and, and well, first of all, are you, and how did you end up in Monadnock? Are you a, mm. a long-timer? Mm, that's are a great you, question. Yeah. How Even you though you know how it is sometimes when you've been somewhere for 23 years, you're still not from there. Yes. Um, <laughs> quick, born and raised in Boston. Okay. Uh, in the late 60s and 70s, so I had a lot of interesting experiences as a young girl in a big Irish Catholic family, um, learning about race and um, community and uh, how to be um, part of a community when you don't feel like you're part of a community, um, which in some ways, you know, maybe led me to my work. Um, and then um, went to, went off to Western Massachusetts for college and graduate school and um, was really fortunate to work with some amazing um, mentors and sort of leaders in the field of uh, racial justice and social justice education. And went off to the North Shore of Boston for a little while to write my dissertation, or I was going to have to, you know, they were going to push me out of the institution. And then um, my husband, Paul Bogdanoff, and I um, came back this way looking for housing in Brattleboro, and we went over the river and found Winchester. Okay. And we love it there. Nice. It is a community that um, is, you know, like many communities, has its own struggles and its own challenges, like every community does. Um, but it's a place where there's a lot of different perspectives and approaches to how we can make it a better place. And so part of what we have to do is figure out how to navigate the, ch the differences and how people want to make it happen. Hmm. So, yeah. And what do you see about where Winchester fits in in the whole Monadnock footprint? Because yeah. you know each community is different, and you work around the area, so you have mm -hmm. sort of a big picture perspective. Mm. Where do you see your town in relation to Monadnock, or where do you see Monadnock in relation to your town? Mm, that's a great question. You know, it's funny because. Um, in conversations that I'm in just with my neighbors, and we live right downtown, so we're sort of like in the, in the middle of, of everything that's happening. Um, we live on the street where the school is, and we love that. Um, we love having the kids up and down the street. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in some ways, you know, when you think about the history of some of the communities in Madinac, in Madinac that were also part of, like, you know, the old mill towns, and then, yeah. you know, Winchester was one of those towns, um, lost that kind of... Um, source of economic growth and economic development when those mills close and then what were the mills can you, um, can you? If, if, as far as i know remember i'm not from there right even though i've been there for 20 <laughs> 24 years um leather tannins okay. i think le old leather mills and if you look at the you know my husband's a fisherman so and a fly fisherman so he talks a lot about the ashwheelit river that certain parts of the ashwheelit down in winchester were really um, kind of polluted because of the leather mills and so that now it's like really becoming a place where people are coming back to and fishing and um, but, you know, I think about folks there now who are doing incredible, like people who have been there much longer than myself, born and raised there, who are really thinking about how to make Winchester a place to come to. Mm. So the interesting thing about Winchester is that we're on the border of Massachusetts and we border Hinsdale, which is close to Vermont. So we have a real opportunity as a place that's sort of a thoroughfare, Route 10 run, runs right through there, to really think about how we can attract people to stop and not just pass mm. through. I think it's been that community has felt that way. I speak from my own experience and personal opinions, um, but that it has been sort of a forgotten about place in a lot of ways. Um, I think a lot of the old towns that were forgotten about ended up being places where um, education was forgotten about, mm. where agencies and organizations who could bring resources and um, opportunities um, 
you know, never looked at Winchester. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, again, the way that I see us is, I often think about Winchester as part of Cheshire County. I don't always talk about it as part of Monadnock. And yeah. I think, again, that's kind of an interesting, you know, narrative. Um, but now we have our kids going to the Winchester High School, I mean, to Keene High School from Winchester. And, you know, I think my daughter went to Keene High, and one of the things we worry about is how those kids feel included and yeah. what's their sense of community there. You know, we're not that far, we're 23 minutes, but in some ways people will say, like, I don't even know where Winchester is, and they live in Sullivan, and it's not that far. So, yeah. you know, I think we have some real unique opportunities there to, um, to really kind of, um, you know, let people know what we're, what's happening, what we're doing there. But um, I also, you know, as a border town, you know, we have a lot of people who work in Massachusetts or who work in Vermont and don't have the same relationship to Keene. So um, what we really need there is public transportation, but that's a different conversation. No, right? <laughs> that would be so a conversation great. that a lot yes, of places yeah, around absolutely. the area would say. It's interesting that you say that because I grew up in Dublin, another little town in Cheshire County, and there is kind of, you know, this this very small perspective sometimes of Dublin mm -hmm. and, and Greater Dublin, you know, we go to Peterborough for the little things, Keene's the big city, but yeah. Winchester? That was not like, what's mm -hmm. Winchester? Nothing. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember the, the, the racetrack, you know, my dad going to, oh, yeah. to watch something on there, you know, so I had that mm -hmm. little, but Winchester, like all these little towns around the area mm -hmm. all tend to relate to Keene mm -hmm. in some way, but not necessarily to each other yeah, at right. all, yeah. even though that's where most people in the area, mm -hmm. I actually have no idea about that. What are the numbers of how many people live in urban mm -hmm. Keene mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. all the other little towns? I yeah. should find that out. Yeah, but yeah. It's a good point that, you know, like what does Winchester know about Dublin? What does Dublin know about yeah. Winchester? What about Sullivan? What mm -hmm. about, um, you know, when you go up to, to Nelson mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all the little far flung over in Antrim. Yeah. Because right. these are Monadnock region. Yes, right. And wildly disparate from each other. Yeah, right. So. I mean, have their own unique personalities, their own characteristics, their own. Yeah. And, you know, I think what, you know, my hope for is, like I said earlier, there's some really amazing efforts with even like young professionals who are trying to think about how to live and stay there building like workforce housing, um, yeah. trying to bring, we have a beautiful downtown um, building that was restored, I'm putting, doing a shout out to the sheriffs um, for the Arlington Inn and Tavern, it's a B&B &B now. So there's real energy and kind of thinking about how do we as a community think about what the future could look like so that mm. we can get people to stay. Yeah. I mean, part of what's happening we know in Northern New England is that our people, our kids are leaving yeah. and not wanting to stay there and there's lots of reasons for that. So, But yeah. we're, you know, it's interesting, we've been there 24 years and um, yeah, it's funny sometimes where you land, you yeah. know, where, where we feel like it also allows for new perspectives and new ways of thinking about things and new co community conversations to happen when you bring in people who are not from there. Very true, which is happening more and more and more as you know, people from cities Absolutely. further south just migrate yes. up here in droves. Yeah. But yeah. again, another topic, I guess. I'm interested in the work that you do. I know you're far beyond the Monadnock region. You mm. do a lot in Vermont, but you know, mm -hmm. here in in the area, yeah. tell us about what you're what you're up to. Oh gosh, um, let's see. I, uh, so my background and my work, my professional work, and really I think about it as a passion, is really um, how do we build safe and welcoming and inclusive communities? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, and I've been thinking a lot, as I said to you earlier, just around the language that we use, around how we're talking about um, allowing for people to bring their full selves to a community, to a school district, to a workplace. And I think language is, is important right now given the time that we're in where things feel you know and are really divisive and um, you know in my world of educational equity we call it you know on the Monadnock Diversity Equity Inclusion Belonging Coalition uh, we, we have all kinds of terms of how we describe just this idea that um, how do we see people in their full humanity you know mm. that's one of the ways that I, I like to describe it and and I think that if we look at a lot of the and some folks may not agree, but I think if we look at the history of our country, we look at the way some of our institutions have been set up, 
um, education, healthcare, law enforcement, government that um, not always um, with the intention of making sure that everybody gets what they need. Mm. And I think, you know, given that we know we are in some unprecedented times around food insecurity, housing insecurity, healthcare insecurity, I mean, all those, that the folks who have been furthest from access are now even further from mm. access um, because of the pandemic and because of a lot of a lot of you know various reasons why we are where we are so and i didn't i wouldn't just blame it on the pandemic i think some of these things were happening long before the pandemic the pandemic so, exacerbated, exacerbated it for sure yeah. so um you know i do in my work and i've been thinking more about how i a lot of my work professionally has been in vermont and sort of on border towns or like claremont and plainfield new hampshire and up in the upper valley but spending a lot of time in communities and in schools in school board meetings select board meetings talking with people about how do they understand um, the, the culture that their community um, reflects and does that allow people to, does that allow everyone to be in those communities and mm. to be, um, to getting access? And, you know, we work in communities, when we live in communities um, that are predominantly white, that are predominantly kind of New England, you know, I'm a, I consider myself a New Englander, and though I'm first a Bostonian, but I grew up in an urban <laughs> setting, but spent a lot of time in Maine. My parent and my dad moved us around a lot. So I think there is, a, you know, all communities in all parts of the country have culture, have a certain way that the culture is. And the question now is, you know, are we a community when we say we have the values of inclusion or the values of we want diversity, we want to support the changing demographic, but what does that really mean in practice? Mm. And how does that show up in um, you know, educational practices or in legislation or in workplaces? Um, um, so you know, I, I, I see a lot of opportunity right now. I feel like in this area, particularly given the coalition, but also just in the Keene area, and, and even in Winchester, we're slowly you know, we may not be talking about race and culture and nationality and religion and some of those more hot button topics, but if we can talk about our core values as a community mm. and talk about what we really say we care about, then we have to look and see if whether the norms and the way the community is built and functioning is actually meeting those values. And that's a lot of what I've been trying to do in my work is here's your core values, this is what you say you care about, and then how does that really match with what is Wow. It was showing up and people will be very surprised when they realize that if they say respect or they say uh, kindness or they say curiosity or that in fact it doesn't really show up in the way that the community or the school is, is functioning. Mm, systems and that's get not, so entrenched. Yeah, I was just huh? going to say, and it's not just because of individuals who are intentionally blocking those things. I think that culture is an interesting the idea of culture and how we build a culture is an interesting thing to explore because um, we have systems that are also really impacting and shaping that. And I think about that in Winchester. You know, even though we say certain things that we care about in our community, some of the ways we want to get to that is different. Some people say economic growth. I say, I don't want a Costco, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want a Walmart. But people are saying, yeah, but we need. So we have to think about how do we nuance and work with some of those um, distinctions but also recognizing that at the end is the value that we say we care about really showing up or not. And does everybody have the same values? What do you do mm -hmm. when <laughs> these people over here and these ones over here yes. are, are driven by things yes. that you know, at least on the surface are yes. in opposition? And you yes. know, we don't think of, I don't think of the Mananoak region as an oppositional place. You know, we're pretty mellow. Mm. Oh, yeah, mm. We all get along with each other, at least on the surface, mm -hmm. it's, it's all, but, but people, you put people together and, and there are yeah. conflicting ideas. And what I like about what you're doing in part is this idea of let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about mm -hmm. what's happening. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? Yeah. What's going on here? Mm -hmm. What do we do? Because you have this value and you have this one and they don't really seem to align. So let's, let's not yes. put our heads in the sand and pretend it's not mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. But then like... Okay, and then now what? Yeah, <laughs> Once right. we've talked about it. So what yeah. are you finding as far as the conversations that come up when, when we name the things that often, you know, culturally or for whatever reason, there's a bit of hesitation to name, 
then mm -hmm. what happens? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, you know, again, some of this is context driven, so it kind of depends on, you mm -hmm. know, where you might be. I mean, I think about the first thing that came to my mind as you asked that question was, you know, facilitation. <laughs> I mean, like, who's who's supporting a conversation, mm -hmm. you know? And I think, you know, for an example, and I'm, you know, I was at a conversation in Winchester, in my, this might have been back in November or December, because there's a real, um, uh, working, there's a, there's a lot of effort and there's a, a formed working group there around workforce housing, just around housing in general. Right. Like what kind of housing Huge do we need? need what do we have area. in Winchester? Where are the gaps? Who's getting pushed out because they can't afford it or they right. can't find it? Um, and it was really powerful because we came to the school and we were sitting at round tables and it was like, you know, World Cafe style and everybody had their work to do and we were having the conversation with people I didn't know. I didn't know some of these people whom I was sitting with. But it was facilitated by someone from the community who's been very instrumental in bringing this conversation. Um, and then somebody who was from the outside who's supporting these conversations at the state level. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that kind of structure is so helpful because then you have somebody who, who's sort of in charge of the space, you know? Um, it's harder when we're like at a town meeting, which here we all are coming into that season, and we just you know had our deliberative session in Winchester. Um, and of course, you have the moderator. But when people are standing up to talk about a particular Warren article and they are in disagreement, or you know, how do we work with that kind of dissent? I think is what yeah. you're asking for. And you know, I think it takes time. I think it depends on like who the people are in the room. I think it's you know, as somebody who's trained in facilitation and running conversations that are hard, part of it is how do you set it up? Do you set it up you know, so that we can have that, that kind of conversation, knowing that there's controversy, knowing mm -hmm. that there might be dissent, um, but that we can also do it in a way that still gets people to listen to each other and, um, and hear and maybe better understand each other. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things I always say is like, what is the goal? If the goal is just to stand up, and like kind of go at it, then okay, then you're not gonna, the, the needle won't get moved, right? right? And that's where you'll land. You're gonna be back in dissent and controversy. But if you mm -hmm. set it up in a way um, and sort of name like what the goals and objectives are. So I know that's kind of in some ways very structured, but um, I think listening, and I'm always working on my listening, is. Um, is really, really essential. And mm. people need to, instead of being ready to respond before someone's done with what they're saying, which I do a lot of that as a trade right. facilitator, but really just sort of sitting with people and having the time to do that. Um, yeah. So, but you know, I also, you know, I know social media is a lot of places where these conversations are happening. I'm not on social media. A lot of people out there know that about me. You can't find me easily. Um, I choose not to be on those platforms. I choose to do this. Because right. this feels like we have an opportunity to have people listen to what we're talking about and maybe, you know, get people to ask some questions or be curious about another way of thinking about it. So, so yes. I'm much more about yeah. in person. I know COVID didn't allow for that. And we, now we have these hybrid models, which I think are much even better than being on platforms and yelling at each other. Yeah. That's me. <laughs> yes. I'm a fan of hybrid. I'm not going to lie. Um, I was going to ask about what you said back there. You mentioned safe, welcoming, and inclusive community. Mm. What does that mean to you? And how do you see that showing up around here or not? How would mm. you like it to expand? Mm. But what's mm. your vision around that? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a big question. And, you know, I think that's a really important one because people have different ideas of, like, even what those individual terms mean. Again, like, what is right? safety? What is, who gets to be safe? Who doesn't ever feel safe, yeah. right? What does inclusion mean? What are, so, um, you know, I think what is important in, as you begin to think about that kind of conversation or even, you know, um, wrestle with it in a community is to get some clarity about the definitions. Because people who are situated with different life experiences or you know, who don't have English as a first language or maybe aren't even from New England or are an immigrant or, you know, come from a different um, class background. Um, safety means different things for different people yeah. based on where they are situated. So somebody is, that identifies as, you know, female, safety is not something that is always true for me. And so I understand when we are talking about the constructs and the ideas of who gets to be safe? Are we talking about psychological safety? Are we talking mm. about physical safety? 
I think sometimes these controversial conversations around race or politics, um, it is interesting sometimes when people start saying that they don't feel safe. And one of the things I will often say when I'm teaching or working with groups is, let's be really clear about what you mean by that. Mm. Are you physically feeling like you're not going to be safe? Because that's true for, for, that can be true for me as somebody who's female identified, right? right? In certain spaces, like when I used to do a lot of law enforcement training and I was the only female in the room, I often wondered about that. Um, but if you are, um, you know, somebody who comes with a lot of, you know, similar identities to the people whom you're with, but you're feeling psychologically unsafe, like, this is uncomfortable, not really unsafe. Those are the distinctions that I think are really yeah. important to make. And so my point is around controversial conversations, there are ways that people feel uncomfortable. There is discomfort. Yeah. If we were to talk about racism in a community, in a predominantly white community that where it's never been talked about before, it's gonna be uncomfortable yeah. for people. Is and, it unsafe? Well, depends. Yeah, again, it depends on definition. Coming at it from the from the trauma work perspective, it's safety is an internal experience, at mm. least through that lens. So we had talked about felt safety. You uh -huh. know, like you and I are sitting here, it's pretty safe. Yes. It doesn't mean I feel safe. And on the nervous system level, it's if there's an emotional experience going on of discomfort anxiety then the body is reading that as oh, i'm not safe and yeah. so then it becomes mm -hmm. a big gray area like yeah mm -hmm. we're safe point. but whoa i mm -hmm. am not safe mm -hmm. and it really comes down to how the physiology of the body mm -hmm. is experiencing mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. um, no that's a good point is. that's a good point and again i think so just to go back to your first question around this i think what would be what's really important is having clarity about what we mean when we talk about mm. Um, how do we create a safe community? Yeah. You know, safety is going to mean different things for pe different people. Like, for example, there's a lot of of kids in schools right now who don't feel safe mm. for all kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that again, as somebody who cares about kids in schools and education, like that, like that needs to be addressed. Um, but I do think that when we talk about the ideas of being uncomfortable or experiencing discomfort because of a conversation that is hard to have, right? that's for me is a different way of talking about safety and it'd be really important to distinguish. To and you know, the other thing about this, Anita, is these things take time. Yeah. You know, I mean, you think about where MDIB Coalition started was with the Racial Justice Commission that the Human Rights Commission or that folks were on, Dr. Morris was on, other people were on. Yeah for a lot, many years ago. I mean, these conversations take a lot of time and persistence and, you know, I think about the John Lewis quote a lot about being consistent and being persistent mm. because, you know, we're not, we're in some tough times right now. And I think we have to, for me, I try to always every day get some clarity about, well, who am I centering? What What is most important? And mm. is it our kids? Is it the environment? Whatever it might be. Um, because we have a lot that we're trying to tackle. And um, you know, I, I worry that people want immediate gratification. Yes. You know, some days <laughs> I do. I'd like to see some things different at some of the schools that I'm working in where I'm working right now. I'm tired of watching harm happen, but it's a slow, mm. it's a slow trod. So yeah. we just have to figure out ways of hanging in there and supporting each other. Yeah. In it. Which is one of the things I appreciate about this area is there's mm. a nice feeling of collaboration. Mm -hmm. People work together. I mean, mm -hmm. really, when it comes right down to it, it's an easy sell when you say, I want to take care of kids. I want to keep kids safe. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, a, that's something that basically every human is on board with that. Although, again, there might be different interpretations yes. of what that yes. looks like. Yes. But yeah. I'm curious to know from you also, I want to bring it back to your own experience a little bit more as far as... Um, Safety, I don't know if I want to ask you about safety. I, I want to end with hearing a little bit of your own personal experience of being here, but I want it to be hmm. positive. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I so sure, 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 sure. So. My own experience of being in the community? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Um, you know, for me, you know, I have so much gratitude for um, the relationships that I have in my work. Mm. Um, and also, you know, I just, if I think about my community where I live, Winchester, 
you know, I think we arrive there with a lot of, you know, first my, my first home, a lot of eagerness. Our daughter would go to school there, you know, just like we wanted to be in the community. And I, and I made some missteps. I made some missteps mm. in the beginning. Um, and so it's really been about sort of recognizing that when we are in community, like, or we enter into communities, those communities have already been functioning. <laughs> and so, you know, for me, it's been a good lesson in that there's a lot of things that are happening. I need to, I need to learn more. I need to build those relationships. And I've been very fortunate um, to find people in Winchester and also in the Keene area, certainly in Vermont where I work. I have a really solid network there. Um, you know, my daughter has had a really, I think, important experience of, of living in a town like Winchester, mm -hmm. where um, she has probably a lot more access and opportunity than some of the kids who, you know, she went to school with. And um, it's been important for her to see some of that and see some of those distinctions and think about how she can enter into ways of supporting her friends who don't have the same um, opportunities as she does. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I have great, I feel like Keene is, um, is, is, uh, is, is a supportive place, <clears throat> for sure. I think the only thing I would offer is um, that we, in many ways, need to dive into some of the more just uncomfortable mm. com conversations <clears throat> and ways of thinking about this, and um, I think we can do it. I think we can. I think I we think can, we too. Are, huh? I think we well, are. I appreciate what you do being, I don't know if, I'm going to say at the forefront, but I kind of have a feeling you're at the forefront. You're at least you are part of, you know, up to your elbows in this work right and now, helping sure. make those conversations happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. So thank you so much for being here today. You're so welcome. To talk I to us about it. this. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It was fun. It was fun. Mm -hmm. And thank Great. you everybody for tuning in today to Voices of Menanok. We'll see you next time. Thank you.